بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to Talking with Teachers this is the podcast of the Lampus Education Initiative and inshallah today we're going to have a very special guest uh, we're going to be speaking to Dr. Ali Atai who is the Associate uh, Dean who is the Dean of Undergraduate Studies uh, at Zaytuna College in Berkeley, California a good friend of mine, <clears throat> excuse me very good friend of mine uh, and uh, a great scholar. And um, I wanted to begin uh, by talking just a little bit about Dr. Ali Atai. Now, Dr. Ali Atai, um, he has a PhD from the Graduate Theological Union in Cultural and Historical Studies and Religion, uh, having completed his uh, degree in 2016, and, um, and also an MA from the Pacific School of Religion uh, in biblical studies, which he finished in 2011. Uh, but also prior to that, he uh, completed an accounting degree at Cal Poly State University in 2000. Uh, he's a scholar of biblical hermeneutics with field specialties in sacred languages, comparative theology, and comparative literature. As a term college, Dr. Ali has taught Arabic, creedal theology, comparative theology, sciences of the Quran, introduction to the Quran, and seminal ancient texts. He receives his BS in accounting from, as I mentioned, Cal Poly State University in 2000. Uh, and of course, eventually will go on and complete his MA and his PhD. Uh, his PhD thesis was, is entitled Authenticating the Johannin Injil, Muslim Polymerinic Interpretive Approaches to the Gospel of, da of John. Uh, this is a faith-based hermeneutic of the Gospel of John in which the entire text is authenticated as being the true gospel of Jesus Christ mentioned in the Quran. So, inshallah, during the, this conversation, we hope to speak a bit about this. Uh, uh, with Dr. Ali, uh, he speaks, uh, of course, not only English, but Persian, Arabic, uh, Hebrew, and Greek. Uh, he definitely is a very um, a formidable scholar, uh, theologian. And so we're going to bring him in. And so welcome to our show, Dr. Ali Abai. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa How are you doing, Sheikh? Thank you for having me. Now, Mila, thank you for being uh, a guest on this show, uh, this podcast. Inshallah, we intend to uh, have many, many other episodes, and hopefully this won't be uh, the, the last of them with you. Uh, and, um, you know, I imagine that, you know, we will be a, a, a normal guest of ours, uh, especially considering that uh, you may become a bit more in demand. We see, of course, that others uh, find you to be uh, an important contributor to uh, the dialogue on Islam uh, in society today, you know. So I wanted to I wanted to begin by talking a little bit about you, more than just for your academic credentials. You know, what would you say? Who is Ali Atai? Why don't you uh, give us something about your background? Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa sallallahu Muhammad wa alaihi wa sahbihi So who is Ali? It's just a a meager servant of God. <laughs> Trying to get the Jannah, inshallah. Um, but no, um, I actually uh, was born in Iran, um, which is uh, um, interesting because um, usually when I'm out somewhere giving a talk or something and somebody says, hey, where are you from? And uh, I give them five guesses and they usually can't get it by the fifth guess. It just doesn't occur to them. Um, but uh, yeah, we came, my, my parents came to America in the late 70s during the uh, Iranian Revolution. I was a year old at the time. Uh, so we came to the San Francisco Bay Area, and I've been here pretty much uh, ever since. Um, and so I, I guess as, as far back as I can remember, I've always been interested in in religion. Um, San Ramon at the time was uh, basically like, I don't know, 99% uh, white. Um, mm. And all of the all the kids in my elementary school, they were very religious, Christian. There were a few Jews he, here and there, right? But most of the students were, were Christian. They all go to church on Sunday. And then on Monday, they talk about what they learn in church and things like that. So they'd ask me, what around you what Around what time are you talking about? Around, around what year? This is. Oh, these are, this is like a, a, the mid 80s. Oh, yeah. Okay. Early to mid 80s. Yeah. I just, I just really dated myself. You know, but, um, but they, yeah, they, they'd ask me, what church do you go to? And so I, I don't go to church. And so, oh, what, what, what religion are you? 
And, you know, at the time, you know, 1980s, kind of a rough time, you know, for Iranians <laughs> because yeah, right. of Khomeini and, uh, you know, the hostage crisis and Oliver North, you know, things like that. Um, so, uh, and to be honest with you, I wasn't, we weren't like a religious family to begin with anyway, right? Mm -hmm. I would say maybe like, maybe most, I don't know, most Iranians that came over during that time uh, were not very religious, um, very secular, you know, wanted to sort of assimilate into uh, the American lifestyle. Um, so, you know, I just, I don't, you know, I don't, I just believe in God, you know, and that every so often, like during, I guess the holidays, um, cause at that time we, we had one TV in the house, right? It was a, it was a 12 inch color TV. You actually had to walk up to the TV and change the channels. Yeah. Yeah. Run out of this dinosaur nowadays. Uh, but during the holiday season, all of these, um, religious movies would come on TV, right? So, you know, the 10 commandments and, uh, Van Hur, Jesus of Nazareth, which was like, it's a long, it's like basically like a 10 hour movie or something like that. And every, right. every night they would show like a portion of it. So I watched that whole thing. I was probably, I don't know, um, probably eight or nine years old or something like that. And I just, every night I sit there and with my parents and we'd watch that. And I just thought it was uh, really interesting. And, um, and so I would start to engage with my Christian peers a lot more, uh, about Christianity. And, um, they tried to basically convert me to Christianity. Uh, but this whole idea of, and maybe we can talk about this later, but this whole idea yeah. of Jesus being God, mm -hmm. you know, that even at that age, it just, it didn't, it didn't make sense to me at all. I thought it was very, very, uh, just kind of disturbing that this, this man is God, um, yeah, I was watching yeah, you said, yeah, yeah, you said you yeah, you, you said that your family you wouldn't characterize your family as being religious. And so it sounds like um you really didn't have much of an Islamic education uh in your youth growing up. And I, I guess Islam would have been more like culture for you. Um, uh, but then it seemed that uh your fundamental, you know, interest in religion seems to have started with Christianity, or rather because of your exposure to Christianity on yeah. Western television. Yeah. And that's somewhat similar to myself, you know, coming up in that, um, I, I would say that I had very much of a cultural Islamic, uh, upbringing. Um, mm -hmm. my family came through the nation and, and then all of a sudden, you know, we grew up with all these Christmas shows and of course, same thing, Ten commandments and all these, these type of programs. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So, I, so would you say that, that that itself would be like your first, uh, the first time you actually developed some type of interest in religion, how much of Islam did you really know prior to that? Nothing. I mean, we had a, my, my parents identified as Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right. And I remember we had a Quran and it was on the top shelf and it was wrapped in a, in a cloth. And, right. uh, I remember, um, I, I tried to take it down one time and I was, uh, confronted, uh, Absolutely. with hostility. And then, so I waited, I remember again, I was in elementary school. My, my parents went out somewhere, me and my sister were in the house, and I actually took it down, and I opened it, and I looked at it, and I said, wow, what is this? What language is this? Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, I remember, like, you know, um, after, I don't know, it was like fifth grade or something like that, and after the holiday break, all of the students, they, they share what they got for Christmas, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, what about, what about me? Uh, so right. we, my sister and I, we went home, and we demanded Christmas. <laughs> so, you know, we got the tree and everything. And, uh, so we got the presents and, but yeah, I think that was, that was it basically is, um, it was, uh, it was sort of being in a Christian, I guess, culture right. and that turned me towards the Bible initially. Mm -hmm. So I read the Bible and understood portions of the Bible much earlier than anything in the Quran. I didn't actually read the Quran in English um until high school and then i didn't read the entire quran seriously um in english until i was about 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. uh, so but before that time i had sort of uh, uh um i i really liked the new testament jesus right his teachings i thought it was, i thought they were beautiful i never identified as a christian and after some point um i actually started attending a a mormon sunday school <laughs> so i had 
uh, many of my friends at elementary school were Mormons, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they're very nice people. You know, you know how they are, very family oriented, very nice. And so they invited me. They said, why don't you come to our school? And so I went there because they're, they're my friends in school. So I went there and um, it was, uh, they were very welcoming. And, uh, but then he started talking about, you know, Joseph Smith and mm -hmm. who's this Joseph Smith guy? And, and then the theology really started to sort of not mesh with me well at all. Um, because, because initially when, when Mormons introduced themselves, they, they introduced themselves as, you know, a, a sect of Christianity. But when you probe a little bit deeper and do some research, you're actually a polytheistic religion. And, and that did not sit well with me at all, you know, and, um, this idea again of Jesus being a God, you know, he's not the God in Mormonism. He's the son of God, but he's still a divine being. Really? Okay. So that again, it didn't sit well it with me. Well. Um, well, yeah, so I was essentially looking for a religion where, where basically Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, is is important, uh, but certainly can't be God. That doesn't make sense to me. How can God eat and sleep? How can God die? You know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been thinking about Sheikh uh, Ahmed Yeah. Uh, and I remember reading, I used to read a lot of his books when I was younger in my teenage years, especially when I, again, committed to Islam too. So the Bible was, you know, very attractive, right? Even, even in my youth, I remember having, I used to have my Bible like marked up and, you know, I would read about yeah. his book, I would watch his videos and I was waiting for the Jehovah's Witnesses to come to, to the door, you know, because everybody, you know, always ready to, to debate with Christians about the Bible. Uh, and so I remember a story that he told about like what actually was a catalyst for him uh, wanting to come out and defend Islam and actually also ex expose some of the problems with the Bible was that, you know, he didn't know much about Islam when he was younger. And then Christians started to come and badger him about Islam and challenge his understanding. And so he decided, it, 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 so it so sounded as if like it was a, a, a reactionary, it was a reaction yeah. to that. He wanted to sort of be uh, vengeful somewhere to an extent, you know, but I mean, of course, a lot of us, you know, we enjoy, you know, I'm going to do that, <laughs> watching him, um, yeah. so pretty much decimate the, the Christian arguments on different uh, levels. I mean, did you have an experience like that? Because clearly you, you had a lot of experience in debate as well. You know, people can search the internet and, look, you know, type in YouTube and look at type in how they apply the debates. And so you can kind of yeah. see that much more fiery. Uh, there's no, I mean, it's still fiery, you know, but back then, of course, it was a lot more passionate uh, in particular with respect to debating the Bible. Yeah. So, yeah, I had, um, when I was in high school, uh, there was, there were, um, you know, there were Christians at the high school, a fair, a, a fairly sizable Christian, uh, student body. And many of them were a bit aggressive. Some of them were polemical. So, uh, they would try to, you know, uh, work their, you know, their stuff on me. And, um, and I just, I kind of got tired of it. I knew a little bit about Christianity again, cause I was reading the Bible. Uh, on my own and things like that. Like I said, I attended Sunday Sunday school for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, I got to the point where I thought, well, I, I need to be able to engage uh, with these Christians a little bit. Um, and during that time as well, I had something of uh, an Islamic awakening uh, because for, and I, and I mentioned this many times in, in previous sort of podcasts with other people about sort of my biography, that my, my dad, for no apparent reason, he, he, well, he said to me, uh, let's go watch this movie, Malcolm X. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember that the exact day was November 18th. It was a Wednesday, 1992. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I said, okay. So we went mm -hmm. there and I, I to this day, I have no idea why you wanted to watch this movie. <laughs> so we go there, we sit there, it's three and a half hours. I'm, I'm bored for most of the movie, wow. but there's something about the, when he went to Hajj, right. Mm -hmm. There's something about that, those scenes that really affected me. And then the the actor Denzel, you know, he recites the Fatiha, and I think it was actually Denzel. Right, right, yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I was like, I said what? And, and I thought to myself, I remember sitting there. And I'm almost 15 years old. I'm four days shy of my 15th birthday, and I and I think to myself, I don't even know the Fatiha. I don't know anything. Really, it's a problem. I don't know Adif from Ba. I don't. I don't. Why don't I know anything? You know. So I, it was kind of like this deep kind of shame, I guess. Um, and then this followed by this really strong motivation, right? So that motivation coupled with my desire to engage with the Christians ended up in me sort of 
becoming a bit of an anti-Christian polemicist uh, myself. So I would engage with Christians. I would preempt them many times. Um, and this carried into college. It got to a point where when I was in college, I would get calls from random uh, imams of Masajid uh, saying things like, uh, Hello, Brother Ali. I say, Assalamu alaikum. I heard you're the best in the business. <laughs> what do you mean? We have some very aggressive Christian outside the Salat al Jum'ah, and they're handing out this literature. So, okay, we need you to come down here quickly. Code red. <laughs> so, so I'd go to drive down to this masjid, and I'd literally just debate them on the street like that. And I, I, I did this for a long time, even at Cal Poly during when I was an undergrad. They had this uh, Thursday night thing called Farmer's Market. We'd, we'd go out and, you know, Cal Poly is kind of the San Luis Obispo is sometimes described mm -hmm. as the California Bible Belt, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's like dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of Christians out and go out and debate. And this was before, you know, YouTube and, you know, so, uh, and that's good. That's good for me because. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no telling, right? Some of that stuff was, was reported and posted. I'd probably. Be, be embarrassed um, <laughs> because it's very aggressive and things like that, you know, hardcore debating. Um, so I would do that. I mean, that was basically what I would do almost every day. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of strange. I was kind of obsessed with it, even just walking around campus because, you know, there's Christian booths everywhere and, you know, there, there's, a, there was always an active presence on campus. I just walk up and start debating people. Um, and then uh, I remember this one time and I've, and I've told the story as well that, I was uh, debating just three or four Christians um, uh, on a Thursday night at the Farmer's Market. Uh, they were students, and I was debating them, and they were looking through their Bibles and this and that. I remember there was this older gentleman who was standing next to them, um, and I'd never seen him before. And after he was just kind of listening, mm -hmm. and then after about 20 minutes or something, he kind of looks at me really closely, and he mm -hmm. says, you don't care about us. That. Uh, <laughs> you don't really care about us right, right. and I said what do you mean and he said you, you, you're, not, you're not interested in our salvation or something like this you're not interested in guiding us or something you just want to win a debate mm -hmm. and of course I said no you can't you can't, you can't answer my claims and this and that and, right, right. and so I went back to my dorm room and I actually had a bit of an existential crisis mm -hmm. I thought to myself wow I mean just to be honest with myself said, yeah he's, he's right this is enough so as I said to myself, look, if I'm going to continue to do this, I have to do this the right way. Right. Yeah. So I wanted to. Yeah, it's really interesting because I was, yeah, Michelle, let's run into it. Because I was planning to ask you, like, you know, um, why we don't see you, like, you know, debating anymore. Because right now there's this new trend, it seems, you know, among a lot of like online Muslim, you know, influencers that, you know, they sort of uh, debate, debate team or debate club or, a bunch of you know Muslims that actually are you know taking a lot of time to um, to debate the Bible in particular in Christianity. Every once in a while, they may mention Judaism, but um, you know, it's become um, somewhat of a norm. Is it uh, this is uh, what they consider to be da'wa, you know, is to to go out and debate Christians about the Bible, and and um, you know, so what you say here, I think, is very revealing and very important uh, with respect to intention, with respect to uh, even how effective uh, that type of approach may be to actually winning people over. You know, how often, you know, have you experienced, you know, people, you know, converting or, uh, you know, they put, people may acquiesce and say, okay, well, yeah, you want, right? you want the debate, you know, but the question of, you know, um, I'm convinced now that your religion is true and mine is false. You know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure how often that that happens. That often as often as some people may imagine. You know, but anyway, you're not knocking debaters. You know, but yeah, I think that was one of the things that happened with me too. Is I started to find when I the more I got into the Bible, the more that I realized, uh, you know, how much about Islam I did not know. Right, you know, so I needed to augment my Islamic knowledge a bit more. You know, I'm not saying that those who actually are debating don't have much knowledge about Islam, but but I think that that's the danger of like, you know, Muslims who don't know any better, who are you know who admire you know the debaters and say, oh, well, I need to study the Bible too, but they don't even know the Quran. Like you mentioned, you know, you don't. Well, I thought you had 15, you know, so it's really interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, we should. I mean, there always should be a group of 
you know, Muslims that are either very advanced students or scholars that engage in jihad with Ahlul Kitab. For me, I just it, it got I just got frustrated with it, and it's kind of one of those things where if you're not in the sort of mentality of debate, it's kind of like being a an MMA fighter, right? <clears throat> if you retire for like five years, it's hard to jump back in the ring. It's yeah. really difficult. You have to sort of put yourself in that in that in that mind frame. And um, I guess I could get back in that mind frame, but for me, it's like, um, you know, I, I'm tired of just hearing these really terrible Christian arguments, you know, just rehashed. And I remember I had to read a lot of literature by anti-Christian polemicists, and it just it put me in a bad mood. And you know, I, I'm just a, <laughs> I don't want to deal with that stuff. So I mean, I'll I'll do like um, I've done interfaith dialogues and things like that, but you know, these these hardcore pol polemical debates uh, against you know. Um, anti-Muslim people. And, um, it, it's just, it's just for me, I don't think I have the temperament for that. Um, yeah. you know, certainly I'm not condemning it. I'm, I'm in no position to condemn debate. I mean, we have to debate, but just for me personally, um, I don't think it's the right thing for me personally to do yeah. anymore. Uh, cause I want to sort of focus on other things. Um, I get calls and emails from people who do debate all the time and I gladly mm -hmm. will share anything I can with them. You know, because if they have that zeal, they have that energy, they have the patience, and they have the temperate to the the temperance, um, the temperance to do that, um, yeah. the temperament to do that, uh, yeah. then that you know that's good. More power to them. Uh, yeah, but right, for me to right. for me to get back into the ring like that, uh, it's it's not like a switch you can turn it on and off. You retired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of retired. Yeah, exactly. I make it out of retirement. You never know what. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, All right. Well, how Right, right. I'll do those. Okay. Um, I wanted to to want you to begin first and foremost by explaining to uh, the audience like you know, what the the title of your dissertation actually means. Mm -hmm. So, authenticating the Johannine Injil, yeah. Muslim Alimeretic interpretive approaches to the Gospel of John. Um, of course, Johannine. I think people can guess what that is a reference to. Most of us will know what the Injil is. You know, the Gospel of Jesus. Uh, so the, of course, the Gospel of John sort of sounds like that's what you mean by it, you know, but the other things about polymerinic, if, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, polymerinic interprets and approaches, what does that really mean, you know, and of course, it just gives sort of an overview of exactly what your overall thesis was. Inshallah, yeah. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what it means anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of coined that term, actually. So it's a, it's a combination of polemical and irenical. So another oh, polemical okay. means to really attack a text, right? right. And kind of deconstruct it and show its falsity. But right. Morenic means to be uh, basically like Irani means peace in Greek, right? oh, okay. um, to sort of try to harmonize uh, things. Right. Okay. Um, so this is a combination of that. So this is basically this is taking the position that, and this is not my personal position. This is something I did for the the dissertation, right? Um, so it's kind of an academic exercise. Uh, I did sort of uh, consider this position for a while, but ultimately I didn't find it to be very persuasive. And um, you can, you know, just watch anything I've done over the last five years, and it's very clear that my position is is not what I argue in the dissertation. But for the, yeah. the sake of the dissertation, um, so this idea that the text of the Christian Gospels is sound, the text itself is sound. But the tahrif is of the ma'ani, right? So the mm -hmm. the scriptural corruption, the, the corruption of the text is not of the physical text itself or the or the, the words, but actual the actual meanings of the text or the the exegetical tradition of the text, right? So what I did was I took the the first half of John's Gospel, which is the prologue in the Book of Signs, which is um, the part of the New Testament, the part of the four Gospels where Christians insist that the deity of Jesus is the most pronounced, right, in the first 12 uh, chapters of the Gospel of John. And I thought, can, can I actually read these chapters through a Islam, an Islamic lens of Tawheed, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so that's the project of the dissertation, that even if we take the text as it is, okay, uh, can we read it through an Islamic lens? And I think that we can. And people forget this as well, is that there were Unitarian Christians that believed in the Gospel of John. Right. You know? yeah. Do I believe the Gospel of John, the original intent of the author, 
was to write a Unitarian gospel. I don't believe that. I think the underlying metaphysic of the gospel of John's author is, is basically a type of um, middle Platonism where you have God the Father at the top of all being and then you have the Son below him. Uh, so it's teaching this type of uh, henotheism where there's really two gods. There's God the Father and then his divine Son. I think that is, that's the theological orientation of, of the author, the Johannine gospel. Uh, but um, there's difference of opinion. Uh, so Unitarians, they would say that, for example, Arius of Alexandria, who was defeated at the Council of Nicaea, you know, his position was that basically these mystical verses in John's gospel uh, have to be grounded in the plain and obvious meanings of Scripture. In other words, you can't give precedence. You can't give um, a, an ambiguous verse precedence over something that's clear. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we find this principle in Islamic exe exegesis and, and Jewish uh, exegesis as well. This is a big problem, I think, for, for Christians, even in the Old Testament. You know, like Isaiah 53, they, they read this. It's Hebrew poetry, um, right? And, um, you know, the suffering servant of Isaiah. In Christians, they say, oh, this is talking about God becoming a man and dying for our sins. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to take that position in light of clear verses in the Old Testament, like God is not a man, that he should lie, and every man mm -hmm. is put to death for his own sin. What do you do with these very clear verses? So they're taking poetry, which is ambiguous and, and symbolical, and they're saying this is the meaning, right? Violating the clear and obvious, unambiguous uh, meanings of the text. So what Arius would do is he's like, look, look, the Father and I are one, John 10, 30. And of course, Trinitarians, they take that to mean an ontological oneness. Right. But Arius would say, well, he can't mean that, right? Because God is not a man, right? Mm -hmm. He also says the Father is greater than I. So how do you reconcile these things? So this is what I attempted to do. So for example, at the beginning of John's gospel, it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you read that in English, um, the word God, the beginning was a word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Both occurrences of the word God are capital G. Right? Oh, but if you actually look at the Greek, uh, mm -hmm. which is the original language of John's prologue, um, there's something very interesting happening. So NRK and halagos, K halagos and prostan feon. So in the beginning was the word, and the word was with the God. There's a definite article. Kaiseos mm -hmm. in halagos, and a God was the Word, and so Theos does not have the, the second occurrence of the word God does not have a definite article, and so mm -hmm. Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, in the gospel in, in any gospel, is never called Ha Theos with a definite article in an unqualified sense. Right? People mm -hmm. will Thomas uh, in in John twenty twenty eight he says, "My Lord and my God," so that's. That's there. There's a way of interpreting even that statement. Would that, be, would that be somewhat similar to the difference between Allah and Rab, right? With Rab, sometimes is utilized. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and Rab, Rab could, could refer to a man, right? Uh, in Greek, this yeah. happens. In, in Greek, Theos could refer to uh, God or a man. And, and Paul, um, he refers to he calls Satan, uh, uh, Theos. Uh, uh, to Cosmo, he calls him the, the god of this world. Oh, really? mm -hmm. So theos in Greek means some entity that has some sort of um, supernatural ability, not necessarily a divine entity, but something that right. is out of the ordinary is called the theos. Right. Okay. Uh, so there's certainly a, a way of reading these texts. Um, but I think one would have to sort of understand also what I call the Islamic theomystical tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so this idea of of uh, a prophet or a saint mirroring the attributes of God, you know. So in order to put some of these statements of the Johann and Jesus, uh, Jesus peace be upon him, into context, like the Father and I are one, what does he mean by that? The context tells you what he means, but it can't mean that he's ontologically the same being as God because that's idolatry. So that doesn't make any sense. So, for example, the, I mean, Christian theology, with all due respect, is a bit um, uh, paradoxical. So the Christian claims that the Old Testament is revealed by God, uh, and God is Jesus, right? And Jesus told Moses, God is not a man. 
in Numbers 23, 19. You know, so, you know, Jesus told the prophet Hosea, Ki anuchi el ish, indeed I am God and not a man. Right, so this is stated many times in the Old Testament. And then, at least according to Christian theology, uh, God decided to become a man. Um, and, and then what he claimed to be God, uh, in the gospel of John, apparently the Jews pick up stones to stone him rightfully because that is blasphemy, mm -hmm. right? And Christians admit, yeah, they, they, they wanted to stone him for blasphemy. Well, mm -hmm. then why would anyone believe Jesus's claim? Right. right. Why does he, in John chapter eight, he condemns them and says, you're children of Satan, right? Um, because they tried to, they tried to kill him. They tried to stone him for blasphemy, but it was Jesus himself, apparently, who revealed to the prophets in the Old Testament to kill blasphemers. Mm -hmm. So you're, they're just doing what Jesus told them to do. Yeah. And now he's saying, you're children of Satan for not accepting my blasphemy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. And I don't know any way in which a Christian can really explain this other than saying it's a different God. And that's what some Christians actually did. There was a Christian, he was a Gnostic in the, in the second century. His name was Marcion of Sinope. He was very popular. You know, one of these sort of Christian groups that are sent down the rabbit hole and nobody ever hears about him anymore. But, but he, was, uh, he was very popular in Rome. Uh, you know, basically, he said that the God of the Old Testament must be a different God because he could not reconcile the Old Testament descriptions of God with the New Testament. Uh, so he's a bi-theist, right? Uh, which, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, mm -hmm. so he was a type of henotheist as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting that, you know, um, I actually was watching and saw a short video yesterday that someone was sharing. Um, there was a, there, somewhere in the United States who pretty much was racist, right? Pretty much racist guy and was pretty much uh, telling the congregation that he wasn't for interracial marriage. Um, and he talked about it being contrary to human nature and to the biblical teachings. And I said to myself when I heard that, I said, well, what is it the, the Coptic church and the church of, of the, uh, the Abyssinian or the Ethiopian church actually older than the church of Rome? Or I don't know. I mean, you can clarify that you know, for me, you know, but it just seemed to me that, you know, to think about, okay, well, if, if interracial or sort of black and white marriage, you know, was a problem, then it would seem that that's a very Eurocentric sort of focus, right? You know, of course, not to take us off track, you know, but it was just, it was just something, um, it just, what you said just made me reflect upon the fact that they're just different uh, iterations of, of, of the Christian theology, I guess you would say, or sort of Christology is different from one place and another, one, one sort of historical period and another. Uh, that one could see that, okay, well, yeah, well, why can't you reconcile these things with Islam, at least one particular interpretation of the Bible, right? You know, which may actually have some roots in Christian tradition. And, and my understanding, too, to correct me, too, is that um, you were s attempting to uh, build upon some assumptions made by certain Muslim scholars, too. I think it was like be a and perhaps, you know, or, you know, um, that wanted to take the Bible itself and face value, you know, and accept its claims at face value, but then offer a proper interpretation. Is that sort of the correct way to understand some of the things that you were trying to do? Yeah, I was, yeah. So, uh, Ibn Umar al-Biqa'i, yeah, he would, he would cite the Bible as a primary text in his, in his tafsir to sort of fill in the, uh, the sort of narrative gaps, if you will, of the, of the Quranic text. Um, especially with stories in the Old Testament. And then he also did a Bible, uh, he did a New Testament, the Dia Tesserat. He tried to harmonize all four Gospels, uh, which is mm -hmm. quite interesting. Uh, so he was, so yeah, sort of my inspiration for this uh, for this project. Um, right. Now, the interesting thing also is that the Gospel of John um, is was probably written around 90, if I'm being generous. Mm -hmm. um, some say as late as 110. So that's, you know, a bit late. I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if church history ascribes the gospel to John, the son of Zebedee, who was a disciple of, of Isa, they said, um, at least according to the New Testament, but it doesn't make a lot of historical sense that John would actually write this. Uh, you know, he would basically, if this was true, then he waited, um, until he was, I don't know, 90 years old, a hundred years old, 
And then he decided to write his gospel. And then he wrote it in Greek. He didn't write it in, in Aramaic or Syriac. Uh, and then, you know, apparently during that time, he was studying uh, Greek metaphysics and, and Greek language and Greek philosophy. And so it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a disciple of Jesus actually, actually wrote this. Um, but uh, it's hard to tell what the original Christians actually believed. You know, I mean, certainly I think most historians would agree with me that the teachings of the current Roman Catholic Church were probably not the original teachings, at least theologically, the original teachings of, of the historical Jesus of Nazareth. You know, did a rabbi yeah. really go around claiming to be God? You know, um, if he yeah. did, why would other Jews believe him? It doesn't, it doesn't make yeah. any sense. Yeah. Well, that definitely brings up an important um, question that I was trying to ask anyway, which is, in your view, I mean, what would you you characterize your understanding of the historical Jesus based upon the biblical script scriptures themselves? Of course, naturally, we have Muslims today, well, at least people claiming to be Muslims today, who even question the very existence of Isa the Latter, you know, that he yeah. actually exists, you know, which we know is itself, um, bla you know, so blasphemous, or at least it's something that's a heretical belief. Um, you know, I mean, how would you characterize the historical Jesus based upon your reading yeah. of yeah, the reason why, I think a lot of this is motivated by just being provocative, right? People denying the existence of, of Jesus, peace be upon him. Um, one of the main reasons why, though, some, some, some bona fide historians have taken this position, like Bruno Bauer, G.A. Wells. Um, there are some uh, modern historians um, uh, that take this position as well. Uh, Dr. Richard Carrier, his book is called On the Hist Historicity of Jesus. David Fitzgerald, there's another one, Robert Price. Um, so they all have their own sort of take on what actually happened, uh, but they do deny the historical Jesus. Part of the reason why is there's no there's no mention of Isa alayhi uh, salam in any Roman source from the first century, okay? There's no mention of Isa alayhi salam from any Jewish source that's authentic in the first century. So. There's a passage in the Antiquities of Josephus, you know, section 18, uh, that does mention him, but there's difference of opinion about that. Um, I would say that most likely the entire section is a fabrication because nobody quotes it. No Christian actually quotes it until the fourth century. So you would think that the early church fathers in their debates with all of these pagans, uh, they would have quoted uh, Antiquities 18, but nobody does that until Eusebius of Caesarea. Um, so he's not mentioned. Again, that's not evidence that he never existed. He, the only the only uh, sources that mention him that are first century are Christian sources. Uh, so you have the four Gospels. You have the letters of Paul um, as well. Um, and Paul mentions that Jesus has a brother named James. Um, so um, uh, so it's, it's very likely that he did exist just historically. So the vast majority of historians well, how about his disciples and, and their yeah, disciples? And, yeah, exactly. Um, so another thing that's sort of motivating um, this type of mythicism, it's called, right? Jesus right. mythicism, is the fact that the gospel seem to be permeated with myth, right? Or legend. And I think this is actually true, especially when you get to the passion narratives, right? And of course, I don't believe that Jesus was crucified, so that makes sense to me. Uh, right. But the dominant opinion is that Basically, that um, there was a Jesus of Nazareth, peace be upon him, um, and that uh, he uh, probably claimed to be a prophet. Uh, he probably claimed to be a Messiah of some sort, not necessarily a king Messiah, not necessarily a Davidic Messiah, but some sort of Messiah, maybe a prophet Messiah, because there's different types of Messiahs. Um, he probably claimed to have performed certain miracles and healings, um, but it's very, very unlikely that he claimed to be God or the literal son of God or that he uh, claimed to have died for anyone's sins, right? All of these things are uh, just um, completely antithetical to his historical context, right? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting also is you have other historians like uh, Robert Eisenman and James Tabor and Hans Kung who... Um, well, take Robert Eisman, for example, who's an atheist, right? Um, but he needs to explain how the Quran uh, got the Christology right, 
and this is something he admits, he says the Christology of the Quran is basically the same as Jamesonian uh, uh, um, Christology, the Jamesonian Nazarenes. Uh, so James was the successor of Jesus, and he was a successor for 30 years until the year 62. Yet we don't have anything from James that's authentic in the New Testament, which is very strange. We have all these letters of Paul, who's not a disciple, who never knew the historical Jesus, but the actual successor of Jesus and the, and the brother of Jesus, whatever that means, who was leading the church for 30 years. We have nothing authentic uh, from him. But Isaac says that somehow the teachings of James end up in the Quran, right? So, so he has to account for that. He can't say it was right. supernatural. This was wahi and it was revealed to the Prophet Sallam and restoring the gospel and things like that. No, his he says there must have been some Nazareans or some Ibionites, right? So the the Nazareans in second century were called Ibionites. It's kind of a pejorative term that was coined oh. uh, by the early Proto Orthodox. Which one was the uh, pejorative? The Ibionites. Ibionites. Yeah, it means the poor ones, like the Mesakim. Oh. So right. like they're like they're spiritually impoverished. Their, their Christology is not, they're not worshiping Jesus. So they, they have an impoverished Christology, basically. Okay, right. That's the way they meant it. Um, so there must have been some Ibionites living in caves in the Arabian Peninsula. And the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to go to these caves and listen to their gospel and come back and write, or have someone write uh, what he had heard from these, um, these uh, Ibionites. Uh, so he's in admission that the Quran's Christology, the Quran of Jesus, peace be upon him, is much more historically plausible than even what Paul was writing in the 50s, right? I mean, for Paul, um, Jesus was a, uh, I don't think but Paul believed Jesus was the God. I think he was a henotheist. He was a Greek philosopher. He was highly, uh, highly influenced by Greek metaphysics uh, and Platonism and, and uh, Stoicism, uh, Epicureanism. So I believe that I believe that Paul believed that Jesus was uh, kind of a a inferior deity, a, a secondary god, a divine son of God who died for your sins, right. a divine savior, right? Right. Uh, so um, I think that that's highly, highly uh, historically implausible that this is the teachings of Jesus himself. Right. You know. So so going back to the passion narrative, for example. Um, I mean, the Last Supper to me is just, I mean, is this, so you have a rabbi who's claiming to be the Messiah on, on Passover, on Peshach, and he has his disciples and he's passing around wine and he's saying, drink this, this is my blood. Um, I mean, that is just revolting to hear. If you're a Jew in that room, um, you have to leave, right? As Judas sure. gets up and leaves because that's, <laughs> you can't do that. You can't drink blood, even if you, even if you need it in a symbolic way. And the Catholics don't think it's symbolic. They think it's, you know, it's, it's literal. I mean, it's transubstantiated into the, to the blood. So did, did a, did a rabbi actually say this? Is this actual, is this history that we're, cause this seems like it's, um, because this idea of theophagy, right? Eating God, right? This, this, this is not a Jewish idea. This is a Greco Roman idea when you eat your God. Right, you take okay. in something of the nature of your God. There's, it's a form of sort of divinization, where right. you sort of um, uh, it, 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 something of the power of that God is imparted to you. Right, and this is the Christian Mass. So mm -hmm. I don't think this has anything to do with, do with uh, Judaism. Even this whole character of Judas Iscariot, I don't think he actually existed. Right, mm -hmm. I mean, okay. maybe he did. I don't know, but you know. Judas, Yehuda, the Jew, Ishkariuth, right? The Jew from the cities, right? So who betrayed Jesus? You know, this, 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 you know, this Jew from the cities, the city slicking Jew, uh, betrayed all of these country bumpkins, you know, from me, from the Galilee. Uh, and they used to say, he used to steal money from the treasury and things like that. I think this is an anti Semitic trope, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you read Dante's Inferno, which, you know, I don't recommend it, but <laughs> if you read down, if you read it, um, you know the ninth circle of hell. That's where Satan is, right? And he's 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 stuck in ice, and it's up to his chest. It's ice. It's not fire. Okay. And in his mouth is Judas Iscariot, and he's just chewing on Judas Iscariot for all of eternity. That's where Judas is. He's in the mouth of Satan, right? The Jew, 
right? It, um, so I highly doubt that this person is even historical. It seems like these things were written much later, and they were written decades later when there was clear hostilities between Pauline right. Christianity and Jewish Christianity. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. fascinating. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of examples like this, especially. So, I mean, the mythicists, they do have a point here that there is myth and there is legend in the New Testament Gospels, especially in the Passion Narrative. I think the whole Passion Narrative itself is just so highly implausible. It just seems like a movie, you know? It's like, is it, did this really happen? If you just kind of read these narratives next to each other, um, mm -hmm. just intuitively you're thinking, <laughs> this doesn't seem like it actually happened, um, <laughs> you know? Uh, but there are de definitely uh, the vast majority of historians, they agree that there was a Jesus of Nazareth, he was probably some sort of apocalyptic prophet, um, right. but never claimed to be God, never claimed to be uh, a divine person. It just doesn't make sense historically that he would do that and expect Jews to believe in his message. You know? Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that. I mean, that's, that's very um, you know, fascinating, enlightening. Now, of course, you know, it's, we, 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 Muslims, we, we have to believe very sympathetically that he is a prophet of a lost concept, you know, which not God. You know, he was the Messiah. He was, you know, we believe in the version first. Um, and uh, this particular show, which uh, we call Talking with Teachers, you know, one of the uh, primary goals is to to speak about important figures from uh, the past and the present, you know, important figures that we believe that people should know something about and they should really take seriously. You know, so naturally, uh, you chose uh, Asa Ben Maria, not only because... Oh, this is an area of, of major focus for you. Uh, but also, I think it's because you believe that he's still relevant, not only for Christians, but for Muslims today. In what ways would you say that Isma Maryam is relevant for Muslims today? Yeah, that's a good question, mashallah. So, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, he spoke of the Antichrist, right? He spoke of the Messiah at the Jal, like literally, like the imposter Messiah. Right. And yeah, it's interesting. He said that, you know, when the, when the, um, the, the preachers stop mentioning him on the pulpits, right. Which is happening now. Uh, that's when the antichrist will, uh, emerge. So it's important for us to, to remember, uh, the advice of the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the antichrist, you know, he's myopic. He has one eye and there's different interpretations of what that means as it's a physical, he's, he's awa. He's one eye, but also this idea that, you know, he just kind of views existence through matter, that it's just materialistic, right? It's mechanistic. Salvation is through stuff, through dunya. This is all there is, right? This idea. Um, so this is, um, from what we can tell, the exact opposite teaching of Isa al Sanam. And there's remnants of this in the New Testament as well. Of course, this idea of Jesus dying for your sins is it almost completely superseded the actual teachings of Jesus. I mean, the teaching, the, the idea, the teachings of um, vicarious atonement and deity, that's all from Paul that was superimposed upon the four Gospels. All four Gospels, people don't know this, but if you read the New Testament, for example, you'll come to the four Gospels, then the letters of Paul. But chronologically, the letters of Paul were all written before the four Gospels. And the authors of the four Gospels are all Pauline Christians, which means they're highly influenced by Pauline Christology. So they put words into the mouth of Jesus that, you know, that the Son of Man will be killed and so on and so forth. And, mm -hmm. um, but um, some of the teachings, the historical teachings, I believe, of Jesus are, are there in the text. Um, uh, this idea of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of giving your possessions to the poor you know, um, of, of not loving the world, uh, of, of loving God with all of your heart, soul, and strength, right? This kind of idea of asceticism. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's really at the heart of his teaching. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter paradise. You know, he probably meant this in a hyperbolic sense, um, but um, the message is, is clear that love of this world is that which distracts us from God. Um, and so we have to put our priorities straight. Um, so this idea is very relevant. And Imam al-Ghazali oftentimes would quote 
from uh, hadith of Isa alayhi salam in our tradition, because there there yes. is hadith, as you know, you're you're the specialist. There you're, you're you're the teacher here. Um, but Imam al Ghazali he would quote hadith in our tradition of Isa alayhi salam because uh, he was dealing with this kind of formalism even in his day, right? So the teaching of Isa alayhi salam it it strikes a balance within us. So if we're becoming highly materialistic, his teaching is highly otherworldly, right? It's about death, moat, and akhira, these types of things, and zuhud. So, so the, the hope here is to strike a balance in the human being, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, Sadduc the Sadducees at the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, these were the high priests of the temple, the Kohanim. They didn't even believe in an afterlife. I mean, they had fallen into almost complete materialism. They denied an afterlife. These are descendants of Harun, alayhi salam. So these are the types of people that he's dealing with. You have Sadducees, then you have, a, then you have the Pharisees who are constantly butting heads with him because they tend to be very formalistic as well. Um, right. But there was different types of Pharisees. Many Pharisees actually believed in him and followed him. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but this trend towards formalism, uh, focus on only the outward, not looking right. at the inward, focus on materialism, right? And that spirituality. Uh, this is really the essence of, of the Injil. And the Injil, I, I, Allahu Alam, was meant to be the, the true mysticism of Judaism, mm -hmm. not the Kamalah, right? It was meant to be the gospel, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But what happened was, you know, you have these, you know, like the Quran says that when Isa alayhi salam came, um, right? Yeah. So you have one Ta'ifa who believed and the other Ta'ifa that disbelieved. And the word Khalifa can mean one man. So it seems like to me here, the Quran is telling us, it's, it's informing us of this, of this Paul versus James paradigm. Right, yeah. You have James yeah. over here who believed, and you have Paul who disbelieved, right? Mm -hmm. So what happened is when the, the teachings of Paul, because he went into the Mediterranean uh, world um, and he preached his gospel, and his gospel basically won the day, especially when Constantine became a Pauline Christian. I mean, he's the Roman emperor. After that, it's game over. Right. Um, so his gospel superseded the teachings of James and the original uh, uh, disciples. Um, but uh, yeah. so, so his version became the dominant. And then, and, then, and then it was restored by the teachings of the Prophet. Uh, and I think that's the way to in interpret that verse. Right. Not that. You know, Pauline Christianity became dominant because of the Roman Empire, but that's Trinitarian right. Christianity. But the fact that Jamesonian Christianity mm -hmm. um, became vindicated by the revelation of the Quran, the yeah, Christianity. So what happened was, yeah, when the, when this Pauline gospel traveled into these lands, you know, that became the dominant version of the gospel, you know, um, and these ideas. That are that are found in, in the teachings of the historical Jesus became basically um, they were superseded, they were they were forgotten, um, mm -hmm. they were replaced with these other with these other concepts. Yeah, mashallah. Well, I think that that was pretty amazing for Israel, mashallah. Really um, poignant uh, reflection on the those verses and and the, the ideas. Um, but um, is there anything that you would like to add? Before we conclude today, anything, the particular message you have for the audience, for the community, uh, that you think um, will be of, of benefit? Yeah, I would. Um, I would just say that, you know, it's it's important to, uh, you know, try to in implement the sunnah in our lives first and foremost. You know, it's um, to control, you know, the nafs and to purify the nafs and. Uh, make good intentions with people, right? Um, and so uh, there's there's a way of making da'wah, right? The Quran tells us, right? Um, so call people to the way of your Lord um, with wisdom. And like Imam Zamakhshari, he says wisdom here means with dela'il, you have to have your proofs, historical mm -hmm. proofs, philosophical proofs, theological proofs, Linguistic yeah. proofs. Mm -hmm. In other words, we have to we have to have done our homework. That's it, Hasana, and with good character, or with beautiful preaching. And he says the meaning of that is with with good character, with good comportment. So both of these things have to be working. Yeah. 
Um, and so this is a prophetic way of making da'wah and the prophet's da'wah. There's no greater da'wah than the da'wah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So just, you know, to implement uh, the sunnah, uh, to know the times that we're living in, you know, right now a lot of non-Muslims are becoming Muslim because just the, the amarat sa'a, yeah. they're, they're all coming true, right? Mm -hmm. And they should, you can't deny it, you know, even if, um, even if, you know, 50% of them um, are, 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 are being noticed by them. That's, they're saying, well, how, this, this is obvious that he, there's something to this. Yeah. Right? And, and as you mentioned as well, you mentioned that, uh, that many of these hadith have some weakness in them, but they tend to come true, right? <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. is very interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so that's, that's a major sign for people. And I think people are starting to realize that. So be a good example, right? Um, implement these, these sort of internal sunnahs, you know, smiling at people, being, you know, jovial with the people. The Prophet says, he was, he always was good natured, right? Um, when he was among, among the people and very con contemplative when he was by himself. Uh, so uh, strive towards this type of prophetic comportment and keep learning, you know, uh, learning is a, you know, there's a hadith, there's, you know, it's probably a weak hadith, you know, um, uh, might even be a fabricated hadith, uh, but it meaning is a true hadith, right? Uh, to seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. This is a, a lifelong endeavor. Um, so never be complacent with your state. Always try to uh, try to improve yourself. Try to learn um, and and pray for people. You know, Dawa. One of my teachers. I I was in Yemen for uh, you know a little bit and. When I got there, I learned that there's a whole adab of making da'wah. And one of the first lessons my teacher told me was, he said, half of da'wah is du'a, right? Mm. So, oh, is it, so he said to me, how, how often have you prayed for your, for your opponents in these debates? You know, are you, are you praying to humiliate your opponent? Are you praying to expose him? Or are you praying for his guidance, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I've debated some pretty... Um, you know, pretty uh, nasty characters in my day. <laughs> it, right. It's hard to have a good opinion, but I mean, we want people's guidance over anything. So that's and that's difficult to do because again, the nafs wants something. The nafs, yeah, the nafs. yeah, it's hard to control. So make do offer people. You know, it's 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 very important. A lot can change hearts in an instant. Ali, <laughs> Yeah. Only because, Sheikh because of the white hair, yes. But. <laughs> you, you're worthy of it. Um, really do appreciate you coming on. Um, Thank you for having me. This endeavor. Um, hope to have you again. And uh, as for you know, the audience, uh, please do uh, support the Lamp Post Education Initiative and tune in uh, the next episode of uh, Talking with Teachers. And uh, we hope that those benefit that came to you today from this particular episode and, and looking forward to seeing you in the future. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We hope you liked this episode. This podcast has been brought to you by the Lampos Education Initiative. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can find other important links in the description down below. Please support us. Looking forward to seeing you in the next episode. Peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.